The most powerful thing you can do is show people why content is so important. There's nothing more satisfying than sitting in front of a stakeholder that said, this is how this works because my wife's brother's third cousin twice removed said this is how they use this service. It's the thing, right? In big organisations, you have a lot of privileged people who are so far removed from the realities that people face and they go, that's how that's done. And it's the hippo effect. But actually, the most powerful tool you can use is real people. Mel Rodriguez, welcome to the podcast. Hello, thanks for having me. How's it going? Yeah, really good, thank you. All the way from sunny Swindon. Sunny Swindon, yeah, not so sunny on the way up, but... (laughs) Good memories of Swindon. Um, (laughs) Favourite place to eat in Swindon, let's start with that. Oh, Los Gatos, definitely the toughest bar. Yeah, on an old town. Yeah. Yeah. If you're not from Swindon, that won't mean anything to you, but... (laughs) Mel creates content with intent, the kind of content that makes people think, feel, and take action. With a background in journalism, copywriting, content strategy, and content design, with a little bit of content marketing, she's pretty much done it all. So this that's the bit where I rip off people's LinkedIn and see how much they cringe when I read that back awkward, at them. I know, that awkward bit where you're like, I need to say something. <laughs> so apart from that, who is Mel? Who is Mel? So Mel is, I've tried to articulate this quite a lot actually, which is where that um, LinkedIn description came from, like a bit of everything, but basically anything content related, like that's been my life since I was a kid writing for my local newspaper. Like it's always been a big part of my life. Um, So yeah, I'm right at the moment, I'm kind of content strategy, um, just helping organizations communicate in the right way, find out what they should be kind of communicating rather than running with the crowd, which is a quite a consistent thing at the moment. Yeah. Um, and yeah, you'll also see on my LinkedIn, I'm kind of an angry working mum as well. <laughs> yeah, I've seen a few posts about that. I think it's all, yeah, I think it's brilliant, by the way. Thanks. For those of us who don't know, you know, content is a very broad term. Mm. Everything is content. Now content to me, is writing stuff on LinkedIn, writing stuff on the company page. But from what I understand, from what you write, it's it's a bit deeper than that. So could you explain to the lay person what is content design in terms of from your perspective? So content design, there's kind of lots of different aspects. I think content is one of those things and industries that shift in so dramatically. So um, it's it's communicating to people but with more intent. So this is why I talk about creating content with intent because Mm. we can't just keep churning stuff out, whether it's um, a website or marketing material or LinkedIn posts. If you want to have impact, you've got to think a bit more strategically about what you're doing. So it's about taking a step back. So content design is very much user focused. So it's based in research. So um, for example, if you were doing content design on a website, you would, you wouldn't, I, I, I always say content design is sort of 80% thinking and 20% writing, whereas the perception is it's like 80% writing and 20% kind of running around with stakeholders. Mm. That's kind of, that's not the case anymore. And in some organizations, that is how content happens, right? Yeah. Um, but it's it's about understanding people's comprehension levels. So are they going to understand that thing you're talking about? Um, relating back to reading age. So is it an appropriate reading age for the audience you're trying to target with it? And starting with what those needs are and helping people with the language. Yeah, so when we were, so for for background, we overlapped in the same organization ever so slightly. Mm-hmm. And I remember we had a content designer working with us and they were talking about the banking application and they were saying, you know, you lot might not know this, but the average, reading age for the people who use the app is however old Mm. and the average numeracy level is that of insert age and it's like okay yeah we need to refocus this because those numbers are pretty low (laughs) yeah um so yeah so the average reading age is nine and um gds are amazing at kind of research and they've done so much research and they're a really good resource for kind of anybody to go to What's gds for those who don't oh know. sorry government digital sorry. services yeah. so they're obviously they have a really specific need which is helping people do things that impact their lives quite heavily so whether it's sorting out your tax or um booking a 
bin collection, you know, yeah. everything that you might interact with the government for needs to be super clear and understood by everybody, right? There's there's no, um, you can't let that slip. Um, it's so important that it's accessible because otherwise the services that we're all paying for aren't accessible to people and that's not fair. So that's a really good resource and there's loads of, loads of organisations doing research into kind of comprehension levels. So mm. one thing that I care a lot about is around the accessibility of language and or accessibility of experience for example so um, there are lots of um, methods that you can use but you need to make sure you're researching you're understanding what those needs might be and actually accepting that a huge proportion of society are neurodiverse have um, disabilities and aren't able to do the things that you might be designing and your kind of happy path. And I think happy path is a very dangerous term in that sense because people think there's an ideal way of doing something and then we'll just kind of... Which goes from A to some... B with no deviation. Exactly. And when you consider all of those temporary impairments as well. So I always think I had a really good example when I was working for a financial organisation. We were looking at our mortgage application process. Mm -hmm. So you've got product owners that know that product inside out and they're like, people sit on a desktop and they sit together, partners doing this. And I, and I literally said, well, last time I remortgaged, I was breastfeeding my child and doing it on my phone. Mm -hmm that you have distractions and it's about those distractions, like everyday distractions, or like you say, like um, literacy levels, financial literacy levels yeah. and all of that stuff. It has to be considered so that you're making it available to everybody that needs it. So it sounds like the government are doing something right for a change. Parts of the government. <laughs> anyway, moving <laughs> swiftly on. So who would be a really good example of content design and accessible content in, in your uh, experience and opinion? Uh, uh, one organisation that comes to mind is HubSpot. So they um, have amazing resources. So I know a lot of people that just go to them for resources on understanding how to even how to do metadata, the best way to do metadata for a okay. website. There's like loads of resources there. But I noticed the other day, Jonathan Coleman, who is an amazing leader that I follow that works at HubSpot, um, was talking about actually hiring AI content designers. They're mm. kind of really ahead of the field and they're kind of pioneering in that sense. Um, but yeah. yeah, I was going to ask about that actually. I actually added this question in when I had some time earlier. From, mm. you know, you see everything, everyone's an AI expert all of a sudden. Um, mm. From someone who deals with this stuff day to day and potentially who could be impacted by it, mm. as could we all, but from a, a content design point of view, one would think that AI is going to be a major disruptor in that. How do you think it's yeah. going to change? And is it a threat to the humans who are behind these ideas at the moment in the near think, future? Yeah, I think as with any technology, it's dangerous when we kind of run mindlessly at it. And that's one of my biggest concerns. And always in the back of my mind, I think about my kids. So mm. they're six and three. And I think we do just run at technology because it's exciting and we think oh yes like this is great let's kind of adopt it and um see where it can take us and i don't think we're thinking long term about how that changes the lives of our kids mm. and they have no choice in that right now and, we, and no one's going to get to a point that where they go oh we've done ai like let's just move on and try something different it's never going away and we keep bulking this stuff on um it is great right so it's how it's used. As with any technology, it's how it's adopted, how it's used. I think the risky thing is when people, it's, I call it the magpie effect. There's some shiny shit and they run after it. Well, I was and just <laughs> Googling then because I wanted to get the right answer. And today is what, the 18th of May. Mm. I don't know if you've heard the, the BT news on the way up today. No. So 50, BT to cut 55,000 jobs and up to a fifth replaced by AI. So they've announced that today. So that's 40% yeah. of their um, workforce by 2030. The 40% might be, you know, I'm reading this off the, off the uh, off Google News now. But yeah, yeah, by 2030, they want to replace 55,000 people with a proportion of that replaced by AI. So I think what people do here is, it's the magpie effect, right? Yeah, They're yeah. running after it. But what they forget is AI is only good as, as good as the people directing it. Yeah. It's never going to be this thing that just directs itself. I mean, there's elements of it and it's really intelligent in areas. But one thing that I can't stand about technology is when people go, oh, that's great. Like we're going to use that. And they run at it 
with no real consideration of how it's useful to them. Mm. So BT, yeah, there might be a really good use case for it. Has it been around long enough to know that you need to scrap that much of your workforce? Yeah. I'm going to say it probably hasn't. And I also think in big organizations like that, change is really slow and sluggish. Mm. So you can have an ambition around it, but if it's not backed up by something that's more solid, more refined, then you'll... I think you're heading for failure, really. Yeah, it's difficult. Like from a customer service point of view, mm. as soon as I hear it's a bot, it's done, it's gone. Because yeah. I know they're not going to be able to get the nuance of language just yet. This is it. I was doing it the other day, and in the end, they just put me onto a, you know, a, a person, yeah. and the problem got solved like that. Now I'm sure that will be refined in the mm. years to come, but at the moment, I mean, this has literally happened today. I think that's a it's a big old move yeah like i i don't really believe they've been thinking about that that isn't just a decision they've yeah made over the last week yeah or, you know over the last couple of months and you know yeah. bt aren't pioneers in ai technology either no so it's... unless you are i think when you this is where this magpie effect comes in right we're running at stuff because it looks fun and exciting mm. but actually no one's stopping and going are we capable of doing something with it there's a handful of companies in the entire world that know how to deal with AI right now and how to implement it properly and what the future of it looks like. Everyone else is going, that looks cool. Yeah, we'll save some money. But I mean, you will have seen some of my LinkedIn posts recently, like just culling a load of people and saying that you're gonna replace it with something else isn't how to lead an organization well. Yeah, moving on to your LinkedIn. <laughs> I've, I've highlighted two, um, two points here and also my own of, I think there's a danger that the AI, to, to a certain extent, could become the new agile. Because if yeah. companies have, they've been, that magpie effect has been going on for years and years, mm. 20 years, whatever, and, and before. But people still don't get it. Yeah. So it'd be interesting. But anyway, mm. you're, these are your words. <laughs> so why has content become so functional? Journeys should be defined by user need. Websites need to be accessible. Google rankings are important. Yep, all of that is true. But something, so sorry, but somewhere along the line, we've made website content so functional and formulaic that creativity is often left behind. When AI can learn those formulas, it's hard to see why a lot of websites couldn't be written by robots. So how do humans differentiate? Knowing when content should inspire and when it should support is a real skill. Finding a place for both is where it's really at which mm. I think is just what you've summarized really yeah and it's one thing you could call me quite hypocritical actually because I've spent a lot of time over the last probably five to ten years working very much in designing digital experiences that mm. are for large organizations that need very functional content people are going to do something and they need you to help them do it yeah that's kind of the purpose of um, websites really and when I left all of that and I went out on my own, I thought, hang on a minute, like I've lost my creativity. All those things I love doing. Like when I, I was a journalist when I started my career and then I moved into copywriting and there was so much creativity involved in that. It was very mm. much about your own opinion. That, from a content design perspective, is the exact opposite of what you should be doing because it's not about your opinion. It's about the opinions of the people you're designing it for. Yeah. But I I kind of had this moment where I thought I've been running at this thing, very like working through functional copy, whether it's UX writing, you know, really kind of micro copy, small, really mm. functional pieces that I'd kind of lost that sense of creativity. And it just dawned on me that we're doing that as an industry as well. And is that one of the triggers that made you go freelance could you tell us a bit more about that journey like journalism yeah. copywriting tech like freelance what what was that what, like yeah i i guess i've spoken to quite a lot of people who've made a transition into sort of content design and content strategy and i'd say mine's quite a traditional route so i started out in journalism i used to um randomly write about the royal family <laughs> used to follow them around everyone needs a niche <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> and actually i i was in my early 20s kind of didn't really care about um where i was going what i was doing didn't have any responsibility so yeah. i could just sort of throw myself into this thing and i just kind of got randomly pulled into um royal reporting and it was a time when you got any gossip you got any uh... oh don't i can tell you why i left journalism okay. yeah 
I, yeah, I it, it was a real eye-opener for me because I've always thought language is so important. I used to write stories. I used to have a column in our local paper when I was like nine years old. I've always cared passionately about telling stories. Mm. And I naively went into journalism, did a degree in it, went into it thinking people care about the stories you're telling, but yeah. actually it's all about the pictures. Okay. They want to see a controversial picture that you're just kind of articulating with the words. So, it, you know, right. even the way people that are contributing to newspapers get paid, so like the photographers get paid like five times more than the journalists. Because it's click, it's old fashioned clickbait really, isn't exactly, it? Exactly, yeah, flickbait. Yeah, 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 true. <laughs> Flicking through the paper. Um, and yeah, and I thought, oh, this is amazing. Like it was a really cool experience for someone in their early 20s going to polo matches and getting paid. You know, um, at the time, this was like the credit crunch era, mm -hmm. 08, 09. And I had journalists that would phone me and go, are you on the Royal Rotor for this? Do you want to go and we'll give you 200 quid to give us the scoop? Like, yeah, yeah. Cool, yeah. Um, and then, yeah, I, there were some red flags. And the, the main thing for me was I went to um, Badminton Horse Trials and Zara Phillips was there and... Um, so the way the um, royal journalists work, so you get accredited journalists that can go around and for some reason they accredited me and you get um, the royal rotor photographers. So they're not paparazzis and there's this real distinction between them. So the royal family are supportive of their kind of royal mm. rotor and they can't stand the pats. It's like a club. Understandably, right? And uh, so I was part of this royal rotor and um, Zara Phillips was annoyed because a pap had put a... Um, camera in front of her horse's face just as she was about to go out and kind of spooked it yeah and she said oh, i wish they'd f off and the guy i was with was like she just told that photographer to f off i was like oh, i don't think she did yeah. <laughs> so zara tells photographer yeah to f and it was off, at the same the like 20 years before her mum had, had told a photographer to naff off at the oh, same okay. horse trial so it was like oh write a story and i'd literally had these photo desks phoning me like come on like the news desk again come yeah. on should we write a story about and i was like but it's not true. And I wrote it and I never wrote another article again. I went home, cried, felt crap about myself. I was like, that's not why I started journalism. And it just, yeah, it was a bit of an eye opener, really. Okay. And then on to... Then I went in, well, I went traveling for a bit, yeah. actually, to get that out of my system. Gaffia. Got back and one of the guys I'd worked for was arrested for phone hacking. And I was like, okay, that's why I don't yeah. do that anymore. Fair enough. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, moved into kind of digital copywriting. So I did... I always think you learn like really good lessons th from every organization. So I went, I think I went f straight from there to ASOS and this was a time when they weren't like a global brand. Yeah, yeah. Early on. They had a couple of sites and it was really interesting. When you think of where um, like translation services are now mm. compared to then. So literally we were launching a German site and I was going into <laughs> Google Translate, shoving this massive blurb and in German it was like three times the length. Yeah that's how we were sort of creating the content. Whereas now translation is a huge aspect of content and yeah. you know, and it's people's jobs. It's not just kind of fling it in Google Translate and, and see what happens. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So I kind of did a stint there freelancing and then I went to um, Vodafone and I ran the copy team there for a while, moved into kind of brand strategy as well. So I was really at the time like cared passionately about kind of tone of voice and mm. having standards for language. And I, I would say that's probably one of the things that's driven me into kind of my leadership roles in content is knowing that you need some structure and rigor around what you're doing so that anyone can kind of pick it up and run with it. Yeah. But that's where it really started because we were um, managing the kind of UK brand and it was, you know, it's one of the biggest brands in the UK. Yeah, yeah. Um, They've just let off a load of people as well, haven't they? I saw exactly that was yesterday. <laughs> I, don't, I don't, I can't watch the news or read the news anymore because it's just yeah. so painful seeing that sort of stuff. Um, but yeah, and then I kind of went back into freelance again. I've kind of flitted between it. Oh, okay. I get to a point where I feel like I've done enough and I need to move on to something else, which is why now I, I contract. I've kind of, I went from Vodafone, had a child, <laughs> little blip in the middle um and then went into like working in financial services and launching um big products there i did a big project for scottish widows launching auto enrollment pensions okay which was just, like quite a fascinating content challenge because mm -hmm. people didn't want it <laughs> <laughs> and the government were going you're now going to pay like two percent of your salary into this so communicating that was a real um, challenge that's where like I've started to see the value of research in the language and and sitting in and directing some of those research sessions research yeah. sessions with users 
how did you go about convincing people <laughs> or what sort of like well what was they the were language you used they were forced into it i think the the thing was and this is where language the user need is one aspect of it right so you've also got the business need you've mm. got the kind of in financial services you've got the governance requirements so we had the fca ev in every couple of months yeah true saying true. this is what we need to do so you're kind of making the best of a bad situation for people because you're like, I need to explain this thing and why it's of value without telling you you're going to be poor when you've retired. But it's going to happen anyway. At the same but it's time. happening anyway. Oh, yeah. And we're going to make it difficult for you to stop it happening. But yeah, I guess it just kind of comes back to that research aspect, just making sure you really understand what's going to resonate with them mm. and being honest because um, there's quite a lot of bad practice I see where, you know, when... I think Amazon's quite bad to be honest. When you go in and you're like, you've suddenly you've bought five things you didn't realise. Mm. It's that sort of stuff. I think is you know like the buy now sort of thing. Yeah, exactly. But you know, it's all about understanding how humans behave and the psychology of it and the situation they're in. So what's what's driving them um, to do that thing and how can you help them do it in the best way? Yeah. So itchy feet back to contracting. Back to contracting. Same same sort of work or completely different um, like what, completely what are you up different. to i would say so for me it sounds quite cliched but this is quite a big life change for me mm. because um you know i won't go into details like we said like bad mouth and organizations but i went through a hellish experience as a content leader um where i was kind of stuck between i i was did a good job of selling content into the organization but yeah. you sell it to a leader that then leaves and then you're starting again and it becomes quite monotonous and you're like they're on their rotation of yeah, yeah and i i'm quite of the opinion now if you're a large organization and you don't respect content you kind of don't deserve people that are going to sit there trying to sell it to you you don't need to be sold content is a really basic requirement yeah, and you yeah. don't have experiences without it like we used to do quite passive aggressive things where we'd go into stakeholders and go this is the website without any words on it still you're happy with that like yeah. or do you want someone to come in and help you create those words in the right way and and bring it together across experiences and journeys um and i think i just i went through you kind of go through this cycle where in your career you're kind of on this hamster wheel where you keep running at something and they don't really get a chance to stop and think if it's what you want to do yeah and I, there were these little triggers like i said like with content design the sort of work i was doing and the work my team was doing was so functional that i'm like i started in writing because i love being creative mm. and i'm not doing that and i you know my husband was going mad because i was decorating the house every weekend and he's like what are you doing i'm like i've got all this creativity i need to use it up somehow so yeah i thought it, yeah, I, I needed to change. And also through, you know, the same thing you get in a lot of organizations where leadership changes, they don't respect what your team does. And then I, I'm very much a kind of, um, I'm I'm led by my emotions a lot. Mm. So I'm like worrying about a big team that are dealing with COVID. I've just had my second child. And then I'm trying to influence leaders I don't know to care about this thing that I think they should care about anyway. Yeah. And it just got really, it just kind of really got to quite a bad, bad place, to be honest, like breakdown stage. Okay. My kids weren't happy. And I was thinking, why the fuck am I doing this? Yeah. What is going on? And actually for me, there's this thing with working mums where you just keep running at everything. And I think that it's a societal thing anyway, but I think for working mums, it's particularly bad. And Well, I was gonna get, uh, yeah. So one of the reasons I like doing this is to, to hear I like to educate myself. Mm. I'm obviously not a working mum, right? Yeah. <laughs> Evidently so. <laughs> and yeah, you've already mentioned some of your, some of your recent LinkedIn posts. Mm. I was going to come on to this later, but but we're here now. What is what is your experience with that and what what can what can organizations and people what can we all do to to help? Yeah. You know? This is a real <laughs> passionate subject yes. for me. Uh, so I do not understand how working mums are still facing so much bias in the workplace. We're at this really weird stage in society where we've gone from, you know, years ago, even our parents and their parents, where they, this traditional model of the man goes out and contributes to the family by earning the money and coming mm. home and his dinner's on the table and women are doing the washing and whatever else and being the primary caregiver. That bit hasn't really slipped. 
So I've seen research that says that um, a woman does like a day and a half of work in a day because it's a yeah. full-time job caring for your kids. And I've posted about this before where I'm like, I'm up at 6 a.m. and I've done 15,000 things for everybody else. But then I also want my career and I deserve to have a career. Yeah, and, and time for yourself. Yeah, exactly. Oh, no, that's, that's well, yeah. something yeah. I'm working but on. But yeah. yeah, I mean, I've, yeah, I've started going to a retreat once a year and it's like three days where I'm like, ah, mm. be me. But it shouldn't come to that. And that's the thing. It's We're just in this we're in this weird place where because of technology and the way we're raising our kids their expectations of everything are you know they they rely on immediacy they don't have any patience for waiting for stuff they want everything now Mm. um we're trying to teach them how to live in a world that we find quite scary right so what on earth do they find with it you know like bullying like my kids are too young for this sort of stuff but kids are going to school and um, you know, it used to be that you were picked on at school and then you'd go home, have some respite. I can empathise with that, being a, a lanky ginger <laughs> yeah. I, I can. That's the bit I can get on board with. Yeah, but you'd go home and that would be, you'd chill out, you'd watch some CITV or whatever and then yeah. you'd get back to it the next day. Kids don't have a break from that now. So Constant. as a parent, not only are you working, trying to support your family, doing the majority of the chores at home, like mm. whether anyone agrees with that or not, we can talk about um, partners helping it's not helping it's your house as well like but it's not equal so you've got this situation at home that's not equal then we've got loads of research that says children need that emotional connection in order to they kind of need to build their resilience at home by being cared for you've got to create the space for that so you've got to create really emotionally supported kids that are getting attacked in the evenings as well on WhatsApp and whatever else and TikTok, there's no break for them. And you're kind of doing that. And then you're trying to have a career on the side. So it- every time I have one of these conversations and that happens every, this is the third series now of these face-to-face ones, there's a potential that something, something that I ask gets clipped up. So I'm, <laughs> it makes me look like a right knob. And I, there's no better way for me to ask it in terms of what can blokes do? <laughs> And that's not in a saviour sort of mode. That's yeah. a, well, the reality is the stats suggest a lot of blokes watch this because there's a lot of blokes in the agile space yeah. and the be whatever. But and it, maybe it's not for you to answer. Maybe we no. should just know. But I like to think in my own house that it is relatively equal. Hmm. But then I think about it and go, I don't do any of the washing, but I do all the washing up. But they're fundamentally different. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like what, what, where I are we think, going wrong? I think... I think the problem, there's a problem at home, but there's a massive problem in the workplace. Mm. So I, and I'll be quite honest, I've worked with men who have been so biased towards women. So like I, um, and I'll talk quite openly about it. My um, youngest child's got a heart condition. Mm. It was frowned upon that I wanted to go back to work. Like, should I sit at home crying all day because he's got a heart condition, but is perfectly capable of running around at nursery? Yeah. That... It should my husband do that? Like, if you've got a poorly child, it doesn't mean that you're suddenly a terrible mother if you want to work as well. No. You can do all those things. And I think there's um, there needs to be much more opportunity for women. But this is it's a really contentious point because there's also re- research that says as soon as you start saying, um, quoting statistics or saying, we want 40% of our, fe- our um, leadership team to be female, a female gets promoted into that on merit and then everyone goes it's only because she's a woman and yeah. it's it's horrible i've been in situations where i've been the only female in a in a male you know white middle-aged male group yeah and people say oh can you come in interview this person i need a pair of tits in my interview like pardon <laughs> yeah, yeah like that's not okay and i think that's I think it's just the way companies talk about it. Like when it's, it's, I don't know what the term for it. It's kind of like culture washing. Okay, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I don't yeah. think that's not a term, but that's the only I'd way like I can... I like tip boxing. Um, it's 100% tick boxing, tick but it's... Tick boxing, I said that. <laughs> tick boxing. Yeah. It's a bit of the other as well. But <laughs> I, th- I think that's it. Like just f- from my perspective, and I'm working on something as a sort of passion project mm. on the side that I want to invest a bit more time in later in the year. But helping people see that you are, I actually think you get more from working mums than most other employees because they're so desperate to keep their career 
and provide for their family because it's not the case anymore that the man is out earning the most money. I know a lot of families where the female is the breadwinner, yeah, but she's also the primary caregiver. She's also the one that cleans the house at all weekend. Like everyone, they're at breaking point. It mm. can't carry on, but I think it's there. It, there isn't an easy answer for it, but I think at home, just asking if your wife's okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty. Yeah. Or just you know thinking. We haven't got kids, so it's it's a bit easier to be honest. It's like yeah, it's slightly different, but yeah, it's it's, it's so ingrained in society to assume that a woman is bad if she wants to have something more than her kids, mm. um, or if we don't want them. Oh, like, that's Could exactly. we, you know. We uh, get asked quite a lot, like when you're having them, well, we've made an active, we've chosen not to. Yeah. You know, and, and there's, there's, there's nothing there's nothing to do with anyone else. Yeah. We, we like our life um, as we are, but there's still that. There's nothing compared, don't get, I'm not comparing it. No. There's nothing compared no, no. To, to, you know, what, what you're describing, but there's still that, you're not having kids, there's something yeah. wrong with you. Well, yeah. They bring nothing to our table. Yeah, and you, you get a, you get looked down upon for that sometimes. Yeah. So yeah, anything else we can? Um, and I don't just mean men. I mean, you know what? I'm, I'm sure that yeah, there's women out there who don't have kids who are who who mm, discriminate against working mums as well. Yeah. I suppose, which to some extent may be even worse. It is. Yeah, there is a little bit of that. Like you think that you can you know women are all trying to find their place in in the workplace it's like you kind of regardless of your situation mm. should be respectful of each other i think it's just about not making assumptions yeah so you know like my situation with my son don't assume i'm not going to want to work yeah because he's not very well don't assume that i'm not capable of it because i'm going to give 10 times as much like you know even now as a contractor i care so much about proving that i can do all of it that i'll stay up till three in the morning working because i've had to stop get my kids get dinner sorted and then i'm yeah. like oh, i haven't done enough today i better prove myself and you go who are you proving it to it's yeah, yeah. do you think that do you think you'll always be like that i hope not but to be honest the biggest thing we can do is raise boys that don't think like that so yeah. you know that's the number one discussion let's say in my household where i'm saying to my husband don't say you're helping me. Literally don't say those words because I don't want our boys to grow up thinking I'll help, you know, they might marry a man. They don't know, yeah, like yeah. we don't know, but if they marry a woman, don't expect her to do everything and, and say that you're kind of helping her out because that's just carrying it on. I think this is where I think there's so much responsibility on parents these days more than anything else because you've got all that societal pressure telling you that you should be back at the kitchen sink. You've got prejudice at work that you're kind of fighting and that takes so much energy as well you don't just go home from work and switch off you're thinking about it all night yeah it makes me laugh on blokes so i'm babysitting my kids today oh my god that oh, is no. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. oh yeah yeah i don't <laughs> that is a real what yeah or like their comment i found this like now my kids one, well, one of my kids is at school when a dad brings a child to a party, it's like, oh, hello. Yeah, yeah. There's 15 mums here that brought their kids to the party. Like that, it's not, you don't get commended for that. Walking in like cock of the north. <laughs> yeah, <like>. Exactly. <laughs> Bringing it back ever so slightly. Although that was that was good for me. Hopefully it was cathartic <laughs> for you. Like I said, I, it's good to have these conversations, but I'd be lying if I said, I don't know, they are, they are pretty difficult. And I've said it on this before. Trying to, to, trying to make this both... Uh, visually diverse as possible mm. and um, neurodiversity is important as well but I would be being dishonest like I'm aware that I could put out you know who wants to come on the podcast it would all be blokes yeah I have to not in a weird way but I have to actively reach out to women most of the time to to come on yeah and I wouldn't yeah I don't know and that well I think that's a really that's a really good thing. And that's where you say, what can I do? Like that is what you can do. If you've got a primarily male audience yeah. and you're bringing women in to give their perspectives, when your opinion is trusted, it's, that's a, it's yeah, gonna I have mean, a knock on effect then, isn't it? It wouldn't be, I would never invite anyone on who I didn't think had anything good, who didn't have something good to say, whether that be male, female, mm. you know, whatever, um, however they, however they identify. Mm. Yeah, maybe yeah, it's a tricky. It's 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 messy, isn't it? Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I appreciate your honesty. In terms of what you're doing now, yeah. In terms of content, 
what are the current challenges you're seeing? Um, has it been a has it been an easy shift back to to contracting and finding clients, etc.? Yeah. So interestingly, um, everything I've done since sort of November time, since I went back to contracting, has been through LinkedIn. And I don't have a big following on there. I post probably on average once a month. <laughs> but it's it's such a I don't mean I preach to the converted here, right? Mm. But it's such a powerful tool. And I, I think people don't get it. I think we've got this thing on LinkedIn where there's so many thought leaders specifically about LinkedIn. They're like, no. I, I know, you know, I'm an expert on this. Pay me to help you do this. I'll help you cheat the algorithm. You think, just put some stuff out there that people care about yeah. knowing or that's useful and you and you'll attract people in like you don't have to be I think it's it I don't like the falseness of it mm. I think it's a really good um social networking site like for um business and you know for me personally it's where like I said it's where I'm getting all of my work but it's also where I share my uh no, it's good, views I mean. as they come into my mind and I get angry about something or I see something I'm thinking right I'm going to tell the world about that yeah, and tell yeah. a thousand people what are the content challenges you're facing at the moment I know you can't I think can't name clients and stuff but generically. no so actually one thing I've learned so personally like I said I went for a lot last year and I got to this point where I was like I just need to be doing something I enjoy and I think it's a challenge for anybody in any industry but I see it particularly in content where there's this fear of getting left behind okay what does that so, mean well like AI is a perfect example hmm. so you've got generative AI where that's like BT people are going we're going to just use technology to do this and we don't need people that is a scary thing right but it's I think the biggest challenge for anyone in content is just having a bit of perspective and going okay like I said earlier how many companies are actually capable of using that technology right now? Some of them might try it and not do very well. That's another story. But it's all so noisy at the moment that we're allowing ourselves to get dragged so far away from what we're here to do, mm. which is create content that, like I said, either inspires or helps. And it is a challenge because, and I've personally found this, where I got into this cycle of, if I don't know about that thing, I'm shit at my job. Or I must be a thought leader. I must do this. And I got, you know, like hit by this breakdown. And I was like, none of that is making me happy. I'm chasing technology. I'm chasing the next thing, reading all these books. Like when I was on maternity leave with my second child, I read about 15 books. Have any of them helped me? Hmm. To an extent they have, but you they're nothing without practical experience of doing those things. I always think of that as um, filling, filling like your brain up like a bath. Like yeah. the water is going to go if you don't use it. Yeah. Like you, but you end up having overwhelmed, you become overwhelmed with all of these tools and techniques and you, you end up never using any of them. Yeah, exactly. But then you're in your mind, your job is more complex than it actually is. Yeah. If you bring it back to you are helping somebody do something that is the essence of what content design is all about, then it's easier for you to kind of rationalize yeah. what are the things I should care about. So the whole thing about AI at the moment and how it's going to change content and the tools you can use, yeah, there's some useful stuff in there, but practically from the, the stuff I'm doing in my life, the only useful thing I've seen so far that AI can do is you give it a list of food and it tells you a meal to cook. <laughs> Yeah. This is in my fridge. Cook it. It's not. It's not feasible right now for me. It's not solving problems that you've got. It's not, and you know, and I'd I say think... Grammarly is useful to me. But again, that's that's only this one small is... example. Yeah, but that's good. So there's that part of it where people are using tools, Grammarly, Hemingway app. There's free tools there that you can use that can help you create better content for yourself. But it's got to be within the constraints of what you're capable of. Yeah, You're not suddenly going to go, right, now I'm going to um, design a service for whoever because I can use this one tool. It's like with anything, you've got to be an expert in it yeah. to use it properly. And thinking about that Grammarly example, actually, the way I write, Grammarly hates it. <laughs> <laughs> and it tells me it's all wrong. Yeah, but whereas people, I love it. <laughs> but people understand it because that's how I talk. Yeah. So it doesn't exactly, it helps me when I'm, when I'm doing work emails and more, you know, grown up stuff. <laughs> yeah. But it doesn't solve every problem because it doesn't get the 
the sarcasm, the nuance and the, the yeah. humour, I suppose. And that's it. It's the human side of it that for mm. some reason we're choosing to strip away. And I think that's the thing we should be indulging in. So in the content kitchen yeah, for organisations to really get it, what would you be taking out of the cupboards? I won't Ooh. limit you to a number. but The most powerful thing you can do is show people why content is so important so that you can show them examples of things that work. But... There's nothing more satisfying than sitting in front of a stakeholder that said, this is how this works because my um, wife's brother's third cousin twice removed said this is how they use this service, mm. right? And and it's, an, it's a thing, right? In big organizations, you have a lot of privileged people who are so far removed from the realities that people face. Yeah. And they go, that's how that's done. And it's this kind of the hippo effect, highest paid per- person's opinion, yeah, yeah. where like we indulge in them in what they're saying and and buy it but actually the most powerful tool you can use is real people that go i'm actually your target market and i don't think like that at all yeah and i had this example actually with a a financial organization that we may have both worked at previously where we were doing this huge agile transformation and um we we had these hubs set up and we had literally the chairman, the directors coming in and looking every month at what we were doing. It's like, cool, that's great, but you should be focusing more on the way we're working and not the output of what we're doing yeah, yeah. because that's the most important thing that's going to change the way this organization works, right? So we're going, okay, we're going to launch a product to kids. Research with kids is quite tricky, right? So they're like, yeah. oh, okay, let's go out to all of our employees and ask them to bring their kids in. So we had all this research and they're like, yeah, oh, they're all really risk averse. Like, should we talk to some kids whose parents don't work in financial services? Like, should we try that? And they're like, well, no, because my daughter, yeah, you earn a huge six figure salary. Your daughter isn't worried about money because she's never had to. Yeah, Hermione Hermione in a private school is not worried about. (laughs) Exactly. So she's not going to have the concerns of most children, yeah. right? Or, or seeing her parents go through the same challenges. Lo and behold, we then go out and do some research with some real kids. <laughs> yeah. Completely chalk and cheese. And I think it's that there's this whole thing where people go, um, we, we've gone through this journey of people need to care about users and design thinking. And then you get to a dangerous point in, a, in an organization where everyone then cottons onto that and it rolls off the tongue with no kind of substance behind it. And they Mm. go, we're going to do design thinking. What do you mean by that? Oh, we're going to look at user needs. How? And it's about literally showing them the process. One of the um, really good tools as a content designer or or processes is is pair writing, where you co-create with someone. So they're going to have an opinion on how to say, communicate that thing. And you're thinking from the user's perspective, neither of those things is necessarily wrong. But when you come together you get a solution that works for the business and the user. Mm. And that's a really nice place to be. But yeah, long-winded answer, but actually just showing them research and and letting them observe how people use their service or product kind of helps design sell itself a little bit. Sounds good to me. Uh, Where else do you take inspiration from? Like outside of the content bubble or... Tech um, bubble. Where do I take What do you listen to? What do you read? So do you, I actually read a lot of parenting books. Okay. But I found this really helpful. So I read quite... When I was leading a big team, I read like quite a lot of leadership books. And then I found... Not that I'm making a <laughs> connection between right. parenting and leadership. But actually a lot of the decent parenting books help you understand how your childhood has shaped who you are. Mm. And I think when you go into a leadership role... I'm quite an insecure person. So then I worry, I'm not a very good leader in that sense. I'm a good leader in the sense that I'll always protect my team, but I'm not very good at kind of up and out stuff because I, particularly when I've worked in places where I'm the only woman in that leadership team and kind of get talked down (laughs) a lot. But actually understanding yourself. And I think there's, there's that whole thing of like reflecting on who you are. I have quite a lot of coaching understanding who I am helps me be a better person in every aspect of my life but it's definitely helped me as a leader um but again it's quite a cliche thing to say I get inspiration from my kids that's not cliche at all. <laughs> if they think something's cool well, I want to do it like my son's desperate for me to work for lego but <laughs> I'm not going to but it's like a plug is that a, uh... yeah <laughs> oh, yeah I'm available no I'm not um 
but yeah, I don't know. It's it's tricky. I think I'm getting to a point where I'm kind of teched out a little bit. Yeah. And actually, the thing that inspires me the most is when I have time to think. So whether I go to the gym or I go for a walk or I'm just watching my kids play, that to me is much more valuable than sitting with my head in a content strategy book. Yeah. Um, I hear what you're saying. Yeah. So what's next, Mel? So I am currently um, contracting, so helping with a content strategy piece for doing a huge website transformation. I hate the word transformation, actually, but um, it's, it's all right. It's all right. It's one of those things, isn't it? Same with agile transformation. I've started going in now to organizations that ask me to help with stuff like this and going, you're using the word transformation, but can we just go to the basics? Yeah, yeah. What does that mean? Are you replatforming your website and now you need me to put the content in? Like, what are you yeah. doing? And nine times out of 10, that is probably what they, what they want. But yeah, I'm doing a bit of work from that. I'm taking the summer off to be with the kids. And then I've got quite big plans from September onwards because both of my kids will be at school and that's my time to kind of really ramp up my business. So I'm, I'm moving a bit more into helping with brand storytelling. Okay, yeah. So I've got some quite cool organisations um, in the kind of pipeline that I might be helping to kind of communicate their story better and bring out the kind of human aspect of what they do a bit more, which is, I think that's the bit like I said earlier, where I'm like craving creativity and now I'm like yeah. throwing myself into that sort of space. Um, and I'm also looking to set something up to help working mums yeah, and working I, content. I sort of got got that impression before when you mentioned a little project. Yeah, I think what I'm trying to do, I won't go into too much detail because no, no. I still need to kind of refine what this offering We won't be. hold you to it, don't we? <laughs> yeah, but one of the things I find is, so I... My husband calls me life's little helper, and I don't think he means it to be quite as condescending as it sounds. <laughs> I just had an image then, of, you know, the Simpsons, <laughs> yeah. Santa's little helper. Oh, yeah, I don't. But. Yeah, life's little helper. Like, I can't help but want to help people. And mm. for me, the thing I, the group of people I want to help more than anyone are like working mums. Do you find it hard to say no? Yeah. Yeah, because I'm just, yeah. Just, yeah. I, I thought that oh, might no, be a trait, yeah. Yeah, to everything. And that's why, you know, like I said. That's why you're here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's why I drove three hours to talk to you. <laughs> no, I and actually that's that can be a really good thing. Yeah. And it's, but yeah, it's trying to solve problems that I face, that I know a lot of women face. I've got a lot of friends that are working content, working mums, and I talk to them a lot. So I have people reach out to me even people who are thinking about having kids and are worried about the impact it's going to have on their career mm. i'm thinking what can we do to take away the stress and the the bit that distracts you um when you go and try and find work so i'm thinking well my background's in content my expertise in working mum yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> i'm always gonna be an expert in that because i've got two kids and i'm thinking what can i do to take the pressure off working mum so they can kind of work much more flexibly and create content, have work they're proud of, but not have to be chained to an agency from nine till five. So yeah, I've got big plans for that, but mostly just being life's little helper. And <laughs> I mean, we'll stick with that. Sounds yeah. like a sounds like a thumbnail. Um, <laughs> you said you post on LinkedIn once a month. I'm assuming you check it daily. Are you happy for people <laughs> to reach out on there, or where is the best place for people to? to reach out and say hello or inquire yeah. about your services, etc. Yeah, I, I would say LinkedIn. So I don't really use other social media. I'm a bit like, I've shut myself off from it. Twitter, no. even before the Elon Musk debacle, mm. just for me was overwhelming. And it got, it was getting me into that cycle of like, I must be posting here and yeah, I must be yeah. doing this. It's like, LinkedIn's quite nice because you can kind of dip in and out of it. Yeah. Um, and you can completely orchestrate what you see and yeah. um, well to an extent there's obviously an algorithm there that's playing a bit of a game for you but yeah LinkedIn is the place to find me um yeah and if you especially if you're a working mum <laughs> keep an eye out because I might have something for you it's a great here. series as well have you seen that on Netflix working oh, mums yes it is, it is good painfully true as well yeah I mean I can appreciate it even yeah. as a you know a non-parent what advice would you give to the younger version of yourself so i thought about this quite a lot actually and i wouldn't give myself any advice okay. Fair enough. <laughs> because i think this is a concern for me at the moment as life's little helper right where i'm like i worry about the generation that's coming up 
starting new businesses and I'm in awe of it actually I see people that are starting businesses they're so successful already um mm. bringing communities together through social media but I think I'm only at this point now where I'm confident enough to do it because I've worked in big organizations experienced a lot of just a lot of different things and actually worked out what I don't want to do yeah. and I think that's so key and I worry about this of the next generation sound like a really old hag by mm. saying that but people that are sort of 10 15 young years younger than me I think oh my god like how are you how do you have the right perspective to do that and not get burnt out by it mm. I'm at a point now where I'm like I'm available three days a week so I'm looking after my kids I won't take calls on this day after yeah, a certain yeah. point I can like those boundaries I place. can set those boundaries because I've got the confidence to know that I'm bringing something but people that are starting out I'm like how because I think you don't really know what you want to do until you know what you don't. Yeah. And you have to kind of earn your battle scars almost. I think, uh, to be honest, I think it can go too far as well. Because I described the situation I was in last year as like people were f f flinging red flags in my face. And I'm there going, I think I can fix it. Mm. Whereas now it's like there's a glimmer of red in the, like three miles away. And I'm like, okay, I'm off. Yeah. And I'm that's okay now. to recognize it yourself as well. Yeah. Giving self self-acceptance. Yeah, exactly. And knowing what your what your strengths are. Like I won't ever work in a large organization again permanently because mm. I get too wrapped up in caring about people and not liking how things are done and trying yeah. to change it. And it's about acknowledging that you can't change everything and you've just got to kind of stick with what you're good at and set those boundaries for yourself. But yeah. That sounds like the perfect end. Thank you very cool. much for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for listening to this month's episode. If you enjoyed the conversation, please let us know in the comments. And also, tell your mates, like and subscribe. I'll see you next time.